All right, tonight we are in um, chapter 18. Um, we're still on Paul's second journey in Acts. Um, he's going to the Corinthians, to Corinth this time. And um, last week, remember Jason, they had to get Paul out of town. He went to Jason's house. He had to post bail. Paul then... Um, So as I'm as I was studying this, I see that Paul was growing weary. I feel in 18 as he was going through the ministry. I mean, going through the town, this town, and um, we're going to see tonight that um, in Corinth there was a um, the uh, the temple of um, uh, Dianus or what was her name? Um, anyway, it was. They had all kind of priests. They were actually um, whores or paid. You could do whatever you want. And if we look at this town in Corinth, you know, we've studied Corinth before. Corinth is just like this town. Yeah. Corinth is a crazy town. Do whatever you want. And all about pleasing you and all about, you know, they had commerce there, this, ships, the whole entire thing. And it was just a crazy town. And we've seen last week that Paul was in another town where he seen that they were all religious and seen that um, they were paying tribute to all these different gods and um, he's seen the unknown God, do we remember that? And he was explaining to them, you know, the resurrection of Christ and they were like thinking, you're out of your mind. And um, Paul, in this chapter, like I said, is grown weary, you know, and I like this, we're going to learn tonight that there wasn't a whole bunch of believers in this town, but, but the Lord told them that there's plenty of people in this town, plenty of believers in this town. They were coming to know the Lord Jesus Christ, I believe. You know, and if we go over to Corinthian, Corinthians, you'll see that Paul was greeting the church in Corinthian and naming people, but actually there was a church there. So this is the start of it, and I like this, so we'll just start. Um, after these things, Paul departed from Athens and went to Corinth, and he found a certain man named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and he became and he came to them. And I like that because, like. I don't like it, but like you see that all of them were kicked out of Rome. Every Jew. They had to get out of Rome. And if you know what they were doing to believers in Rome at the time, you see that he, he got rid of all of them. Three. So because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for by occupation. They were tent makers. Actually, they were, back then they made tents out of leather. And if you look at this right here, if you see that a Jew would always have a trade. They weren't bums. They were making a living and they could always, in case anything fell, you know, went wrong, they could always fall back on what they had as a trade. You're going to see very little of that in America today. Just thought I'd throw that out there. Because <laughs> most of these people don't want to work anymore. But, um, yeah, he was a tent maker, so... They had something in common. And he reasoned with them in the synagogue. Oh, did I miss a line? Oh, so because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked. For by occupation, they were tent makers. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jew and Greek. So we notice that Paul always goes in the synagogue every single town he goes in. He hasn't learned yet. That's what I look at. You know, that was Paul's passion, the Jews. You know, because he was a Jew. Five. When Silas and how do you say it, Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia. Paul was a com compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. But when they opposed him, they blasphemed. 
he shook off his garments and said to them, Your blood be on your own heads. I am clean. From now on I will go to the Gentiles. So if you look at that, back in the day, the Jews, when they come out of a Gentile town, they would shake the dust off their feet. Because they didn't want nothing to do with them. Now Paul's switching around, and if you remember when Pontius Pilate, when they were crucified, crucifying Jesus, Pontius Pilate washed his hands. He said, His blood is on your hands. And what did they say? Let it be on our heads and our children's. Right? Do you remember that? So Paul's switching it up on them. And this is one of the times that we're thinking that Paul switched his ministry, but we're going to find out in the next chapter he does go back in the synagogue. But he is his main focus now is to the Gentiles. Uh, where am I? Thank you. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man named Justice, who one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. I like that too. So if you see this, this name here, you're going to see his name in the book of Corinth too. And it'll be a different name, but they had three names, a Jewish person or other people. They had three names back then. He'll be in the book of Corinth too. And I forgot what his name was, but someone will probably know it here. And I like this, that it was next door to the synagogue, meaning it was just a wall splitting the two. Then, what's that word, Ben? <coughs> Crispus. The ruler of the synagogue believed on the Lord with all his household and many of the Corinthians hearing, believing, and were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in, a, in the night by a vision, Do not be afraid, <clears throat> but I speak, and I do not keep silent, <clears throat> for I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. Now remember this is a vision. And Paul must be thinking, man, where all these, I'd be thinking where are all these people at, right? But they're going to be Christians and they're going to be believers to come. That's what I believe it says here. But we'll chew that up too. And he con Continue. continued there for a year and six months teaching the Word of God among them when Galileo was pro-council of Achaia, okay. the Jews with one accord rose up against Paul and brought him to the judgment seat saying this fellow pers persuades men to worship God <laughs> contrary to the law. I like that right there. We know what the Pro council was the. I mean the the judgment seat is when people did wrong in that town. You had to go up in front of him, right? But I love this right here. This guy separates church and state immediately. Do you believe that? Right when we read it, he just separated it. And then fourteen, when Paul was about to open his mouth, Galilee said to the Jews. If this were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O oh Jews, there would be there would be reason why I should hear you bear, bear, with, bear you. with you. But if it is a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourself, for I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat. When all the yeah. Greek, what well, then all the Greeks, took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him before the judgment seat. But Galilee took no notice to these things. I like that right there. You know, it's just it's crazy because they're bringing him in front of it, and then all of a sudden. The tables turn on them immediately. 
Isn't that just like a crowd? <coughs> I mean, that's the way I see it, just like man. But the judgment scene was a big thing back then. You know, if you were committed, I mean, you were doing crimes, they'd bring you in front of the judgment seat and he'd rule over this. I like that he didn't rule over their laws, of their Jewish law. He had no business ruling over it. So Paul still remained a good while. Then he took leave of the brethren and sailed for Syria, Syria and Priscilla and Aquila were with him. And I was looking that up, why they would put the woman's name first. She was probably well known. That's the only thing that I could look up, that she was well known more than her <laughs> husband or something. But we'll chew that up tonight too. With him, he had his hair cut off at Centria, Centria for he had taken a vow and he came to Ephesus and left them there. But he himself <coughs> entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews when they had asked him to stay longer, lo a longer time with them. He did not consent. 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 But he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this going coming. feast coming in Jerusalem but I will return again to you God willing and he had sailed for Ephesus and then when he took an oath it was a, um, a Leviticus oath? No, a Levite oath? Does Nazarite. Any, huh? Nazarite. A Nazarite oath, thank you. And we'll chew that up too. And I like that too when he had to get to Jerusalem and then he says I'll be return if God willing meaning He's trusting in God. And when he had landed at Caesarea and gone up to greet the church, he went down to Antioch. After he had spent some time there, he departed and went over the region of what's that word? Galatia. Name? Galatia and Phrygia. Phrygia in order to strengthen all the disciples. So he's going back to him. Uh, 24. And now a certain Jew named Apollos, born at Alexander, an eloquent man and mighty in the scripture, came to Ephesus. Mm -hmm. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. Meaning that he was he studied the scripture, like you know, and um, he only knew the baptism baptism of John. Meaning that that's as far as he went. But I like what happens. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. When Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he did this, what's that word? Desired. Desired to cross to Achaia. Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting. exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he had arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed, though grace through grace, through grace for he vigorously refuted. refuted the Jews publicly, shown from the scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. I like that that you know Aquila and Priscilla showed him that Jesus Christ had to die on the cross because the only thing that he went up to was the baptism, correct? So with that I'll open it up. I think that verse 9, it says, Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. Do not be afraid, but speak, and do not keep silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to hurt you, for I have many people in the city. And then when it comes down here to 18 and 19, um, it says, So Paul still remained a good while while he took leave of the brethren and sailed to Syria. 
and Priscilla and Aquila were with him, and he had his hair cut off, um, for he had taken an oath, and he came to Ephesus um, as um, um, Richard. Richard pointed out. Uh, the the vow is believed to have been been a Nazarene vow, which normally wasn't done outside the region of Nazareth. So theologians go back and forth over what the exact vow was or where it came from or what it was, but due to the fact that God had came to him in a vision and as as there were those that came up against him and he wound up going before a judge, the end result was still favorable, so he made a vow out of out of thankfulness to the Lord. Even though he wasn't in Nazareth, he wasn't in that community, he still made that vow. And and for whatever reason, it isn't explained here, so you got to kind of guess. Um, and he came to ne uh, Ephesus, and from there, and left there, and he himself entered the synagogue and reasoned with the Jews. Um, as the beginning of the chapter, you pointed out that he shook his dust from him and he was done with him. I mean, if any of us were in the same shoes as Paul, we'd have probably been done with him over and over again. It always ended badly, um, usually with him getting knotted up somewhere and left for dead. But he couldn't leave it. He couldn't turn his back on the Jews. That was all the way through his ministry. He, he kept going back to it repeatedly, regardless of what happened to him. Um, and I think that sometimes in our lives, we continue to do the same thing, regardless of the bad results the last 1,500 times we went to try to minister to somebody. You can't help it. you got to keep it up, because sooner or later you're hoping that they receive the gospel in the Lord Jesus Christ. <coughs> um... And then it talks about the few other places that they go from there. And then a certain man, a certain Jew named Apollos. Have you ever heard of a Jew named Apollos? No. This is the only time. That sounds Greek. It is Greek. Um, or, or if it's not Greek, it, it's definitely not Jewish. And then it's from uh, Alexandria, which is down at the bottom of the continent, down below the Dead Sea, so it's more down off the corner of Egypt. So it's not like it was of Roman descent, but it's unusual that this Jew was named Apollos. And it says it was an, he was an um, eloquent man and mighty in the Scripture and came to Ephesus. This man had been instructed in the way of the Lord and being, in bold letters, fervent in the Spirit. So he knew more, he was being led more by the Spirit than he was by knowledge. Yeah. Because it says he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he only knew of the baptism of John. <laughs> so it's like he knew a lot right up to that point. But from then on, I think it was Paul's job to come alongside of him and bring him to that next level. It was a divine appointment in the two of them coming together. So he began to speak boldly in the synagogues with Aquila and Priscilla. And Priscilla, excuse me, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. So he was bold, kind of like some of us when we first came to the Lord, maybe some still sometimes. We may be bold in what we're preaching, even though sometimes we don't accurately know what the heck we're talking about. We still have the power of the Holy Spirit, and we're trying to be persuasive in what we know. So it kind of draws a little bit different picture of who Apollos was before he come under the teaching of Aquila and Priscilla. That was just a couple parts that I had. What we're talking about here is you would shave your whole head, then when it grew back, you would take and cut it again, and then burn the hair as a burnt offering to the Lord, right? Yeah. But we don't know what the vow was. Anybody else? I think that temple that you were talking about was the temple of Aphrodite. Yeah, Aphrodite. Well, I couldn't remember. Yeah. I had it in my head before I came here, but, you know. Anybody else? Uh, Caesar destroyed that city, and then... No, the Romans destroyed that city, and then Caesar... A century later, came back and rebuilt it, 
And like you were saying, it still turned out to be the same old town. I mean, with all the lust and everything in it, it still was the very same. See, when, we're, when he's talking about an air about them sailing, you know, um, one way was only like, I think it was three, three miles on land, but to go around it was 200 and something miles. And it was always, they were saying that it was a death sentence to go that way. So the trippy thing is there's a canal there now, right? A Corinthian canal, but that was started out back in the back one before Paul. And then it only recently got done in, well not recently, in like 1863. It's pretty crazy. They would take the boats, unload them, and roll them across land just that three miles so they didn't have to sail the full 200 and some miles. It's pretty crazy. Could you imagine seeing a boat on big logs rolling it across the ground with, uh, with hella slaves? Not just a couple, like a bunch of slaves. And you could probably get picked for that job if you were living in that neighborhood. If you were poor, just saying. Ah, you know what I'm saying? But I love this that Paul, man, he just, he just, um, every time goes in the synagogue and knows the outcome. Some are going to come to the Lord and some aren't. And it's just like us. We're, you know, some of us plant seeds and some of us, why we're going to learn about that in the next chapter too, just like this. But we might be planting one day and we might be watering the next day. But it's not what we say and not, you know, that, that it's all God's doing that someone comes to the Lord. You know what I mean? It's, it has all to do with Him. So like Paul going into the synagogue, he, he might be watering that day. He might be seeding that day. Just like us, you know, it's going to change. And I love that what Russ says because I thought I was pretty smart sometimes in the Word going to tell someone about the Lord Jesus Christ. And all of a sudden, they grew up in the church and they're like, well, isn't it like this? And you're like, er, oh, <laughs> let me get the Scripture out before I go any farther. Anybody else? I like uh, that part that we talked about already um, about how um, Apollos had all that, you know, he was speaking boldly and fearlessly and, you know, you can think of people in your life um, where you see them kind of, you know, doing that and instead of like confronting him, I like how Priscilla and Aquilum took it aside and I just think that's a good lesson to learn in life is to have those conversations that are like really spoken with grace and um, kindness and then you can see <clears throat> that their conversation was effective because then Apollos um, it's, it was, says was very helpful to them um, um, after after that and so I just think that you know that boldness and the fearlessness is, is something God honors but then he brings people aside to kind of to kind of help guide and when we're speaking the Lord, speaking the words of the Lord, and telling people about Jesus, it should be with love. Amen. Not knowledge. Amen. It should be with love. It, we should be bringing it to them and showing them the love of Christ and what He's done for us and how His love has been outpoured on us. We should, and it, I'm going to tell you right now, it doesn't always go that way. And then we become a resounding gong. Just saying, I've been there before. After he had talked with uh, Aquila and Priscilla, it says he greatly helped those who had believed through grace. And it sounds kind of like that he believed through grace too. He was reading the scriptures and the grace of God was upon him. And that's how come he was able to help these guys greatly that believed through grace. And I thought, how do we believe in the first place? It's God's grace that is shed on us abroad that we we believe because if you don't believe you're condemned already you know if you don't believe so this believing thing i think the lord helps us on that not because we like you were saying uh, not about so much knowledge but about simply love mm -hmm. you know god loves us you know russell yeah uh, along the same lines it says and when he desired to cross to Achilla, Achaia, whatever however that's pronounced the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, 
he greatly helped those who had believed, who had believed, yeah. mm -hmm. who had believed through grace. So their grace and their mercy and the way that they received him taught him because he was received in that grace. He was received in that love. And that's how we treat people when they're going through stuff and the Lord shines through us and we're able to minister to them through our actions and through our love, Christ's love, not ours, because our love stinks, but through Christ's love to those, then, then those see that part of it and want to receive and are encouraged by it. That, that's a powerful part of the scripture. Apollos and Priscilla... And Aquila, that was a good example of iron sharpening iron way back when, you know, right from the right from the beginning. And uh, I lost my other point. <laughs> Sorry. And that's why we come to this Bible study. That's why we go to church. But that's why we're always in fellowship with each other, so we could sharpen each other. And you know you're gonna see. All believe the believe me, they weren't perfect, but they were seeking the Lord. And the cool thing is, is they were bringing each other up and telling each other, "Hey, this ain't right, or that ain't right, or that." You know, just like when the, he said, "No, you need to know more." And someone's always gonna know the Lord a little bit more than us, and bring a new, um, not new, but our relationship's gonna get better with the Lord. Especially if we stay in the Word. You stay in the Word, man, you get filled up every day. I love what Russ told me when I years ago. He said, um, what does seven days make? One week. Seven what is, days without the, the Word of God. Yeah, makes, and a week. I, makes a week. One week. I mean, if you ain't in your Word, you will be weak. Yeah. And the world will eat you up. Like today, I, this guy come in. Oh man, it's time to get for me to get right with the Lord. He knows the Lord. I said, cool. I said, what are you doing tonight? He goes, oh, I get off at five. Why? I said, come to Bible study. When's the last time you read? Oh, well, wait. Er, er. Like, no, bro. The only way you get right is with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. These Jews weren't right until they started believing in the Lord Jesus Christ. Just like us. Ain't nothing good in us. We learned that the other day. Last Friday, we learned it. We've been learned. We know that. But I meant, you know, like you look at Isaiah. He says, woe to me. Without the Lord forgiving us and having His grace on us, and man, it makes you want to read more. It makes you want to dig in more. Anybody? Mike. I like what you said there about speaking in love and not so much as head knowledge, you know, or try to impress people with your ability of being a theologian. I mean... I guess Satan is a really good theologian, but he's not saving anybody. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because he knows the word. Russ, to touch on what Mike was saying a second ago, um, when Aquila and Priscilla heard him, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. And when he desired to cross to Achaia, the brethren wrote, exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed. Leading into that, if Aquila and Priscilla had been legalists, I mean, think about that. If they were stout Baptist legalists, I'm sorry, and and would turn aside saying you don't even understand you don't know the second half you're only baptized in John's baptism mm -hmm. you don't even know the Lord done dude would have been finished but instead they came alongside and not only loved and encouraged him through the rest of the story which I'm sure he was jazzed about once he received the Holy Spirit but up to that point, it could have went the other way really bad, but instead, because of the time they spent and sharing God's love, look what turned out. He went on to continue into Ephesus, hanging out with his disciples and preaching the gospel into new, new areas, and took that same letter of baptism into Ephesus 
and was baptizing there in the Holy Spirit. That's in chapter 19. But it could have all went the other way if they would have been your typical legalist that wanted to take it. You don't even know what you're talking about. You missed the best part and just popped that balloon. Instead, they came alongside with love and encouraged and ministered and taught into this guy's life to where he could go on to be the dude that he became through Christ Jesus. Good point. It's real easy for us to become legalistic. We all get caught up in it from time to time. But God. We don't have the answer to anything. But God. Big G. And that's the way we had to do it with love. I mean, because even if it's those people that you look at and you go, there is, we were having this conversation this morning, me and my sister, and we kind of flip-flopped a little bit, but on my little brother, she says, there is no way that that man, Philip, could get the gospel. She didn't say it like that, get God, whatever, get to change. That's nonsense. The worst of the worst gets the gospel. We're prime example in this room. I'm not going to point or say anybody's names. You know what I'm saying? But one guy sitting back there with a bald head, that's all I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> I'll say it. <laughs> Believe me, I didn't know it was coming. I told Kenny many a time. I didn't uh, I didn't think I was, I was going to ask. You know, I mean... Uh, I don't know what came over me, I asked. I mean, I was perfectly happy being a sinner. I mean, uh, it was a long time. And uh, it's like I said there, you know, even evil people know there's a God. I just chose to serve the other one. I was perfectly happy with where I was. I don't know what brought it on. I, don't, I can't tell you that. Kenny kept praying for me, and it just happened one day, and I started, <laughs> I started reading the Bible, and... Uh, in that fish tank, I was in there 67 days with nothing but a Bible, and uh, some things hit me, and I wanted to change, and that was the difference. Well, nobody made me do it because they can't, and uh, nobody can make you. Uh, nobody can make you want to come to God because there's nothing this side of hell that's going to scare you over here, not to get over there. But that ain't what scared me. I don't know what did it. It was just something. It came over and it was just a good feeling. And I struggle with it. I still do and I'm still walking there because I am definitely not anywhere. Just I'm just on the path. That's all I can say. What hits all of us. I'll let you have a little news flash. It was the Holy Spirit that does it. Right? Because <laughs> right, none of us woke up one morning and went, you know what? I think I'm going to go follow the Lord Jesus Christ. That sounds like a good idea. Now to the world, that sounds like a horrible idea, doesn't it? And to these Jews of the synagogue, most of them were probably saying, that's a horrible idea. When they, but the thing was that they had the scriptures in front of them that was leading up to them. And they still missed it. So don't be surprised you miss the boat sometimes either. Right? I was talking, I was thinking how <laughs> Scripture says it's God's kindness that leads us to repentance. Mm -hmm. What I like about it is, is He leads us. It's almost like Hansel and Gretel, He puts a little thing out there. And maybe we grab it and say, oh, that's pretty cool. And then we see more and we keep following. He just keeps... Because we're not cattle. We don't need to be driven. We're sheep. And if you drive us, we scatter. But if you lead us, we follow. Amen. And God just has His ways. I know He had His ways with me of little things, little incidents, people along the way. And each one did something. It just caused a hunger to know uh, maybe there is hope. Because I had no hope. You know, I was just kept thinking, isn't there more to this life than what I'm living. Amen. And I began to see little things, you know, that kind of gave me a glimmer of hope. And so God was leading me to His kindness. You know, He wasn't throwing a whip and said, here, take this. 
crack whip here. Listen to this guy that he just placed people in my my way, and I had the choice to go for it or not. You know, accept it or reject it. So that's what, to me, is so awesome about God is He just has a way to lead you without forcing you. You know, He says you're free to choose, but you know, if you want something better, here it is. What did you find, Jesus? Jesus wasn't the one that was lost. <laughs> Ever. Uh, I like that. That you know, people think. This is a little off subject, but it's going to go back to what he said. Just like we said, no, we didn't find Jesus. He found us. We we're the one out there. But the cool thing is, is Jesus ain't tripping. He's got his feet up on the world. He's sitting on his throne. He's kicking back. And he's, he, I have this. He's not stressing. He's not like, oh, man, poor so-and-so over there. Scott ain't never going to find me, man. No. It's, I got this. He knows exactly who he called. Amen. And he wants every man to come to repentance. Amen. And how do we do that as Christians? We check ourselves. Check your heart. Amen. Check what's going on. Ask the Lord if it's right or it's wrong. That's what I have to do every day. Because like if I don't, I'm a wreck. And we all have jobs and we all have life. But our thing, our thing is, is to be seed planters and sometimes, and sea planters are waterers, mm -hmm. right? Are we, we bring in wood to the fire, or we bring in water to the fire to put people's fire out. Are we loving on people? Are we, you know, these, Paul was loving on these guys. He was giving them the truth daily. And they didn't like it. And people ain't going to like you if we're given the truth. They're going to see something in your life, people of the world, they ain't going to like you. That's... The main that's the thing. They hated Jesus, they're gonna hate you. Especially in these times. We're ruining their party. Paul was ruining their party at the synagogue. Here comes the party pooper. Woo! Three times in a row at a synagogue, and they were like, Oh, this dude Paul, we're bringing him in front of Galileo, and he is gonna get it. And this time it didn't work out so good. Right? And we're going to see this, we've seen it repeatedly in the Gospels. Paul did not stop. He had no fear of man. And we should have no fear of man. We should always, if God is with us, who could be against us? In any situation. And um, singing a song when you're going through it is really hard. I mean, try to sing a song when you're going through it. Sorry, I didn't mean to break down, but I'm telling you what, man, you have to pull through it. You have to do what the Lord tells you to do. I could have left here tonight. I could have said I'm not coming here tonight, but I see my mother laying on the floor and I was tripping. <clears throat> and some of it's out of selfishness, too. You know, because we're all selfish. But we ought to give that love to other people that's out there. We have to be there for them in the gospel. That's our job is to bring the gospel. So I mean, you know, I'm here tonight because the Lord called me to this. And that's the way we should be. Diligent in whatever it's called and what we do and what we commit to with the Lord just like Paul did. Let this be a lesson that we have to tell the dying and lost world of the Lord Jesus Christ. And if we don't, then we're in the wrong. Amen? Paul knew what he was doing. Paul, Paul didn't. You know, right there he said that the Lord's with him. And he's going to go through this. We're going to see in some scriptures where he says, one of them says, look man, your hands are going to be tied behind you and they're, you're going to die. <laughs> and you know what Paul said? If it's for the gospel, he put his head on the chopping block. He laid his head up on there for them to take it. Because he knew what was on the other side of that. Ain't that awesome? We know what's on the other side of that. But we let the part of this world hold us back. Oh, no, it's all about the Lord Jesus Christ. And what we do is we do it for Him. 
So with that, anybody else? Very comforting to Paul when the Lord spoke to him in, in a vision that night and said, For I am with you and no one will attack you or hurt you, for I have many people in the city. And I think, man, as many times as he got beat and tore up in cities, that must have been awful comforting when God told him that they're not going to attack you or hurt you. I would have thought, thank the Lord. I don't know, I think he kind of liked it. <laughs> I'm not positive, but I think that's the only time yeah. that he was ever reassured that it was going to be okay because from the very beginning the disciples were told for this this guy for my name's sake will suffer suck. much and he did every time he turned around beaten and left as dead shipwrecked all the other things that he went through God said that was what was going to happen. I think this was the only time where he got encouraged through a vision. Don't worry about this time. It's going to be better than all the rest of them. <laughs> it's only, it's only it's be to you. We didn't read between the lines. It's only for this town. Yeah. <laughs> the rest of them, not so good. So when you're going through it, just understand that you're called to this. Sorry, the white picket fence and all this groovy stuff that you thought that people told you, all these television evangelists, you're going to get lots of money, you're going to drive fancy cars and this and that. No, you see this church ain't that big. And it's never going to get that big because we're always going to speak repentance in here. And we're going to tell them the truth. And people are going to leave. That's just a fact. So do you think um, we co go ahead? I like that real quick though on that part because it it's proves that God's promises are true. Because next and right after that, before it says just as Paul was about to speak, Galileo speaks. So God Forward. stepped in right there before him. So it just shows that his promises are true. He doesn't have to trip. So. Let's see how that's awesome. It's also I like the emphasis of the couple because it's so important to have two, two uh, God, godly and husband and wife and how effective and powerful they can be like the two that Kenny and I discipled under when we met <clears throat> um, and that we can be if we're you know if we're discipling people the, the effectiveness of and they were mentioned and, and Paul ad admonished them in another <coughs> epistle maybe even more than one I'm not sure and that um, I also like the emphasis on him being a, a tent maker because uh, it was a, like Kenny said, the Jewish um, rabbis had a trade and so the unsaved couldn't accuse him of trying to gain money off the gospel and or Aquila and Aquila, Aquila um, as well. And he was a big, he was a big emphasizer of, you know, you don't eat, you don't, or you don't work, you don't eat. So, and I mean, I would never want to be, I would never want to be a minister only. <laughs> that would just be weird. But I'm sure there are some, and I'm sure they're legit. I just, it, I just like that it emphasized that. And I also like the emphasis of him being kind of like Ezekiel, uh, I think it was Ezekiel 316, where it talks about um, Ezekiel being a watchtower it is now it came to pass at the end of seven days if this is in Ezekiel 316 that the word of the Lord came to me saying son of man I have made you a watchman for the house of Israel therefore hear a word from my mouth and give them warning from me and that's what he he was doing and and then uh, shaking his shaking the dust off his feet the blood isn't isn't on his hands and that's that's how that's how we have to be and I remember a couple times at work, uh, you know, not doing that, just pressing in and pressing my point. But this teaches me, you know, just shake it off. Don't waste your time. That hurts sometimes. It's hard to do that with people that, you, I mean, anybody, you don't want to see their soul die. Anybody else? Richard? I was thinking, you know, we are talking about Paul and all the, the times he had to pull himself out from under the rock. Got beat, was in jail. And every one of these times, he got up, shook himself off, and continued in the Lord. He didn't get discouraged, say, I've had enough of this. 
And every time he got up and continued in the Lord, it's like aroma of the risen Lord is all over him. I mean, imagine his disciples, his buddies, standing there at this pile of rocks, and all of a sudden he just gets up, pulls himself out of those rocks, and goes into the city. That had to be an influence on those guys to encourage them, you know, realizing what kind of Lord they serve. And it's Anytime God does something to us and we're broken, something leaks out of us that affects people. We break in, but we get up and we continue with the Lord. We're, we're, it's like a vapor that just goes around touching people. It affects people. It changes people's minds. And maybe even turns somebody's life upside down. Which is, you know, it's, and, you know, he said, take up your cross and follow me. And then he says, I'm crucified with Christ. But it's not me that's living, but it's Christ. So whenever anything happens to us, it's, it's Christ coming through. Because we stand up in his strength and we just press on to what he called us to do. And it's, it's an awesome thing to be able to do that, to want to do that. Um, when when Paul was mentioning how how reassuring that must have been when he got that vision from the Lord for I am with you that was reassuring and that might have been the only time he got that but we get we get that all the time because it's not only that scripture but other scriptures many other scriptures that the Lord is I I am with you I will not forsake I'm always with you and we don't have to hear it in a vision we hear it in our word and it's not about a it's not about a feeling it's about a knowing and and some and i'm preaching to myself because the other day i was in the just crying out where are you lord you know i'm like and knowing he was right there i don't and then i'm like oh yeah you're right here <laughs> so it's, it's about a knowing you think we covered chapter 18. Oh, you got your hand up wayne does no. <laughs> <laughs> All right.